Bibles. Um, where do I want to have you go? Let's just go to Acts. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We'll be there in a, a few minutes. Um, but as you know, we're studying the Gospel of Luke. We're in verse uh, 48 of chapter 24. And uh, in regard to that, our Lord is saying to the disciples, you are witnesses of these things. And as we've been noting, the word for witness in the Greek, again, it does mean an observer, someone who has witnessed something. And so therefore, it's led us into an understanding, and we could call this part of the doctrine of witnessing, although this isn't the exhaustive uh, doctrine in regard to witnessing and being a witness. But as I shared with you on Sunday, I uh, went to the uh, Internet and I just looked up for a quick definition as to what a witness is uh, in general and see where that led me. And it led me to a fantastic website that talked about being expert witnesses in courtrooms here in the United States of America. And then within that, it went into various principles of what it means to be an expert witness. And I started to go through them one by one and was just chuckling as I went through it because I said every one of these applies to the Christian way of life and what we should be doing and how we need to be prepared to be true witnesses for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus is making this statement, as you know, he's saying it to the 11 apostles plus the other disciples that were there in the room with them when he presented himself in resurrection body. But basically putting on to them and having reminding them that they were witnesses of the complete ministry of Jesus Christ, including what went on the past week through his trials, his scourging, his crucifixion, death, burial, and now his resurrection. And as a witness, you see, it's one thing to witness something, but it's another thing to be a witness, because to be a witness means now you're conveying the information that you have seen, heard, or information that you know to other people. And that's really what Jesus is trying to tell to them at this point in time. You have seen and observed these things, but because of that, you're going to go now and tell the world all about me. And so that was the mandate. And we see, and uh, as we continue on in understanding the post-resurrection of our Lord, prior to the ascension, we see him now speaking to the disciples. We'll see him speaking to them in Galilee, then coming back to Jerusalem. And in that place, too, he will now give them the great commission, as we call it, sending them out to be the apostles, the evangelists, the witnesses uh, to the world of the Christian way of life. So uh, we're going to see more of this when we get to those sections. But right now, you are witnesses of these things is what's in view. Again, the noun there in the Greek is mart martais, you could say. The U is somewhat like a Y sounding, but martus, martais. Uh, ultimately, the witness or witnesses, it's in the plural, observers. So again, anybody who has visibly seen and observed something is a witness as we know. Here and elsewhere, this word is used within the Gospels uh, and in the New Testament, but specifically the Gospels for, uh, or I should say, in a legal sense. And this goes all the way back to the law in Deuteronomy chapter 19, where our Lord said in order to convict somebody or even find them innocent, you need two or three witnesses in order to come to a verdict. So again, we see this word being used in the translation of the Greek for the Old Testament Hebrew uh, in what is called the Septuagint. So in any case, uh, we see this word being used for that principle as well, which gives us the idea that this is a witness in the witness stand in a courtroom during a trial. And as you know, we are all part of the angelic conflict. And right now we're part of the appeal trial of the angelic conflict where Satan has appealed his sentencing to the eternal lake of fire. And now God has granted him the appeal. And now the human race is being unfolded. And that is the courtroom trial or the appeal trial of Satan and the fallen angels. And you and I have the great honor and opportunity to be witnesses in the courtroom of the appeal trial in the angelic conflict. And as I said on Sunday, we are witnesses for the prosecution who is God. But as we also recognize in a courtroom situation, both the prosecution and the defense can call witnesses to try to make their case. 
Satan, certainly, we're going to see that towards the end or uh, throughout this study this evening as, as well. He certainly has his false witnesses that uh, spin the lie and share and spread the lie. So therefore, God needs witnesses that are going to show the truth and reveal the truth and ultimately shed the light of righteousness and justice onto the world. And that's the opportunity you and I have to be as believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because we have been given a, uh, <coughs> a title and a position as being and I, what I used to call, and I still do call it, we are professional Christians, but as we also recognize, we are ambassadors, royal ambassadors for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And therefore, we are witnesses of Jesus Christ. So in regard to that, on Sunday, we noted these four main categories, and then there were subpoints behind all of these. And again, you can go back, get the notes, or watch the lesson from Sunday. But ultimately, the four main categories uh, uh, you know, started with what is an expert witness and how are they uh, applied and used. What are the expert witnesses used for was the second main thing. And then we also noted when to bring in an expert witness and the extent to which they can help. And then number four was can an expert witness affect the outcome? So in each of these, we saw the definitions from a secular uh, mode of operation in courtrooms. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and again, from the website that I had, it's a professional build a business that gives and has expert witnesses for hire, as it were, to go into a courtroom so they can give evidence and help support someone's case. And so all these definitions are what we see in the secular world, in the legal realm as well, inside the courtroom as to what a witness should be, and more specifically here, what an expert witness should be. And as you know, as royal ambassadors for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, each and every one of us should be an expert witness for our Lord Jesus Christ. And as you know, spiritual gifts have been given out at the day of your salvation. Some of you may have the gift of evangelism or evangelist, I should say. And uh, therefore, your ministry is evangelism. They, too, are absolutely a witness and should be an expert witness based on the spiritual gift that God has given to them. But just because they have that gift does not make them an expert. They need to get into the Word of God, learn the Word of God, and then utilize that in their witnessing to those who are lost and dying in this world. But even if we don't, and most of us do not have the gift of evangelism, but that doesn't matter because in the Bible, every Christian has the uh, uh, ministry to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so whether we have the gift of works, or uh, not works, but gift of administration, I should say, uh, the gift of pastor teacher, certainly they have to do the job of evangelist too. Uh, the gift of exhortation, the gift of, uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, prayer, uh, the gift of helps, all the different gifts that are out there. Regardless of what your gift is, we all have the responsibility to witness for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And even to couple our spiritual gift with that role of being a witness in some form or some fashion. So in any case, we went through those principles, and tonight I'm going to finish up the rest of the principles that were found on this website. And I'm going to give you straight their definitions, okay, as to what it means to be an expert witness, and then you can just kind of sit back, and I've given you some uh, you know, hints as well uh, in my notes as to how that applies to us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I found it fascinating, uh, you, know, you know, point by point as I went through all of these things. So the next point that we uh, are noting and talking about, and we did note this a little bit on Sunday as well, but qualifying to be an expert witness. And again, not everybody can be an expert witness. You have to qualify to be an expert witness according to the laws of our land, especially if you're going to be an expert witness in a courtroom on a trial. <clears throat> so there are qualifications. And certainly we recognize as believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we too need to be qualified in regard to witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as I just said, you may have the gift of evangelism, but if you've never learned the word of God, you're not going to use that gift. And you're certainly not going to use it appropriately. 
Because just by believing in Jesus Christ does not give you enough information and ammunition to go out and witness. It certainly is an expert witness to have the maximum impact that you should have. So therefore, there are qualifications that are necessary. Now, as we look at it from the secular realm, again, the law is very clear on what qualifies an expert witness. The federal rule of evidence, and I'll give you this in notes as well, the federal rule of evidence 702 deals with expert witnesses and determines that to qualify a witness as an expert, the person must demonstrate scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge that will help the trier of fact understand the evidence or determine a fact in question. And again, I underline two things in, in, in my notes, maybe in your notes as well, but certainly demonstrate technical capability, either experience or some kind of knowledge that you have. And again, demonstrate it. So again, in a courtroom, in order to be an expert witness, they have to have some experience at this. And it has to be demonstrated that they can speak in regard to that situation and the evidence that is being presented. And so therefore, they have to demonstrate their understanding, their knowledge, and their uh, capability to support what they are talking about. That goes for the Christian as well. Again, we can't just say, oh, I'm going to go out and witness for Jesus today. And as I think I talked a little bit the other day about, you know, standing in a subway sign and hoping, holding up a sign saying, Jesus saves, okay? That doesn't qualify anybody to be an expert witness, okay? What you have to do is get down and dirty with people. What you have to do is get to their level. What you have to do is have a knowledge of Scripture from a number of different facets and a number of different places, both Old and New Testament, so that you have plenty of ammunition to address any one situation that you might be in. And you never know what situation you're going to be called to. So we are to be prepared. And there should be some demonstration of that preparedness. So what does that mean? We need to have some experience. How do you get the experience? Well, again, I've given you this in the notes as well, and we might see this a little bit later on as well. But in any case, you know, testing your own knowledge, testing your own capabilities, testing how you think you would go about witnessing to someone, okay? And also doing that with other people. And maybe somebody who is more experienced, more spiritually mature than you are in the field of evangelism or in the field of witnessing and go with them. Watch them, observe them, and then allow them to watch you and observe you and be ready for any critique that might come with an open heart that you're just looking to do things better and do it right for Christ. You see, we need to demonstrate that we have the capability to go out and evangelize people of this world. <clears throat> and God is looking for you to demonstrate that capability. And he first looks for you to demonstrate that you have specific technical or otherwise specialized knowledge. And the knowledge that I'm feeding you from the Word of God, the Bible doctrine that you get every time we come, is part of that specialized knowledge. Why? Because the people on the street don't have that knowledge. The people out in the world do not have this information, but you do. And not every Christian has this knowledge. Why? Because the churches aren't teaching these things. They're more of a ritualistic uh, uh, church. They're more of a community church. They're more of a social club church or a rock star club church, okay? And it's not about getting the specialized knowledge that every Christian should have that God wants us to have so that we're prepared with the knowledge to go out and witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. So again, we see that as the first part. And then also in part of the definition from a secular realm, it goes on to say said witness must be qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education. If the person demonstrates these qualifications, then he or she may testify in the form of op opinion or otherwise if all of the following conditions are met. Okay, And actually, I think I, I drained that onto another slide that uh, I'll show you in just a minute. But in this first part, again, qualified knowledge, skill, experience, training, education. Okay, Why are we here every night? 
to get this information, to get this knowledge, to get this education, okay? And yes, it may seem a little scholastic to you, okay? But this is what the Christian way of life is all about. Didn't Jesus, you know, get up there on the night that he was resurrected and stand before the apostles after he had already gone, uh, uh, went on the road to Emus with the other two disciples and taught them from the law and the prophets and the Psalms? And then after doing that all afternoon, he comes back and now meets with the disciples at night and once again goes through the law and the prophets and the Psalms. And he teaches them who he is, all about him, the prophecies that were made that he now has fulfilled so that they would what? Have that knowledge lock, stock, and barrel. And oh, by the way, he had taught them before these things already. So he's repeating, repeating, repeating. Now they are going to retain that knowledge, have that knowledge, have that experience, have the training and education. Didn't we also see Jesus Christ sending them out on missionary journeys when they were coming from Galilee down to Jerusalem? He did it twice. At one time, he sent them out raw. He said, don't take anything with you. Just go out. And they're like, whoa, wait a minute. Well, we, you know, what do we know? What do we know? Just go. Just go. And you see, our Lord is okay with somebody stubbing their toe if they're out there on the missioning field because they're not an expert yet. You see, we have to have that training. We have to have that education. We have to have that experience. So don't think that you need to ultimately be the complete expert all at once, okay? Because part of being an expert in any field means there has to be experience in that field. And with experience comes failure many times. Because don't we learn more from our failure than we do from our successes? So again, you're going to stub your toe. That's okay with God. It's all part of the training process, as long as you learn not to do it the next time. I could get into a whole thing about the quarterback for the New England Patriots right now, okay? But I won't, okay? Bill Belichick said, you can make a mistake, but make it once. Don't keep repeating the same mistake. Because if you do, you're not going to have that position any longer. You need to learn from your mistakes. I did. I just launched into it. I can't help myself. <laughs> okay. But in any case, go get the experience somehow, some way. And at the same time, get the knowledge by taking in the Word. You know, coming to church, understanding the principles and precepts, going back and reading the Bible and the text on your own so you can put two and two together from what I've told you. And again, the information I give you in the three hours a, a week or, you know, say two hours and 45 minutes because I don't do a whole hour on Sundays. A week, that's it. You think that's going to be enough for you to be an expert in the knowledge of Jesus Christ? No. You've got to read the Word, study the Word, take the information I've given you, study that out, and so that you know it and have a good understanding of it. So again, the demonstration of qualifications is necessary so that they can testify you know, and give their opinion, give the facts, give the understanding of who Jesus Christ is, and go out and not and start to witness. And as it also says, following the conditions, uh, these conditions are met. And there are three conditions that they have in the secular world that need to be met by an individual so they can be an expert witness. Oh, by the way, don't you think that has biblical principles too? And it does. The first one is the testimony is based on sufficient facts or data. You see, uh, like I said, you can't just be a believer in Jesus Christ and never have the Word of God studied, not know anything about the Word of God, and think you're going to go out and be an expert witness for Jesus Christ. Okay? And you can repeat, Jesus saved, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, okay? But you're not going to be able to answer the questions of this, that, or the other thing that people have in regard to how does he save? What does salvation mean? Why do I need to be saved? Are you going to have all that information? Are you going to know all the various doctrines of redemption and sanctification and justification, atonement, and all those other things? Again, without the Word of God, you're not going to know those things. And oh, by the way, the Word of God also gives you great examples, especially the Old Testament. You see, the New Testament is more of a narrative. The Old Testament are life stories that are being portrayed in the doctrines that we see in the New Testament. 
And so again, part of getting your experience isn't necessarily going out onto the mission field, but learning from those who have been on the mission field that are found in the Bible as well. And what did Joshua do? What did Jeremiah do? What did Ezekiel do? What did Isaiah do? And especially when we think of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they were going through, uh, oh, excuse me, let me say it this way. They were great prophets witnessing for Jesus Christ during their time when their country was going to hell and then was being overthrown by the Babylonian Empire. Do you ever think about that? Daniel was a great prophet when he was in captivity in Babylon by the Babylonian Empire. And then the Medo-Persian Empire after that. Again, they did it even though their country was falling apart in apostasy. Uh, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. Maybe we should do that too. Okay. <clears throat> but in any case, they give testimony. They give you example. You can learn from them too. That's why, again, read the storylines of the Old Testament. See how they dealt with things. And then, again, be able to parlay that into what you're doing. So, again, plain and simple, it's imperative that we know the Word of God so that we can teach about Jesus Christ. Now, the second qualification is the testimony is the product of what? Reliable principles and methods, okay? And I kind of like that one, okay? Reliable principles and methods. What is more reliable than the Word of God? You see, the Word of God is absolute truth. And the Word of God does not change. And God does not change. He is the same yesterday as He is today, as He will be forevermore. There's nothing more reliable than that. And there's nothing more reliable than the principles found in the Word of God. And there's nothing more reliable than the methods that God has given to us in His Scriptures about how to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Nothing more reliable than the method. And then the methods post-salvation for spiritual growth are there too. And we see both in the positive, you know, encouragement aspect. And then if you read the book of Corinthians, especially 1 Corinthians, Paul's having to chew out the Corinthian church because they're already going into apostate. And so he's got to straighten them out. So the methods are given us there as well. Let's learn those methods so that we can help others with those methods. And with that, again, we do not theorize or hypothesize about the Word of God. We don't theorize or hypothesize about what salvation is. We get it directly from the Word of God. How must I be saved? The Word of God tells us. So we don't theorize or hypothesize. We don't make things up. And we don't add to it, unfortunately, as many Christian denominations have done throughout the generations. So again, we don't do any of that. And then we don't have to get all caught up in people's perspectives about him and their own salvation. Okay. You can start with, what do you think of the Christ? Definitely start there. What do you think of the Christ? Understand where they're coming from and then say, okay, let me bring you back around to who is the Christ. Because you don't have a full concept of who the Christ is. Let me give you more information. Let me help you with that. So again, an expert witness, the second qualification, reliable principles and methods have to be applied. Again, we need to know the Word of God so that we have those reliable principles and methods. And then the third uh, qualification is the witness has applied the principles and methods reliable to the facts of the case. Here's that experience aspect again. Have you witnessed to somebody before? Have you led them to salvation before? Or have you seen other people do that? And you know the tools and uh, resources that they have used. And so now you can apply those. And so again, the principles and methods reliable to the facts of the case. And so what are the principles and methods reliable to the facts of our case? Everyone is brought into this world as a sinner from the womb. Most people don't realize that and understand that. You do. 
We cannot save ourselves through our works. It's faith alone and Christ alone. Most people don't know that. You do. Again, you apply these principles to your life, and then you can apply them to other people's lives as well. So when you know the doctrines, when you know the scriptures, now you've got the principles and the methods. And you've got experience using them first in your own life and how you walk and live in the faith rest life. Now you can give that to other people as well. Or you've had experience with other people to go out into the mission field or evangelize or witness, uh, and therefore now you can go do it yourself. What's stopping any of you from starting a home Bible study? This church started because one woman sat down with my mother and went through the book of John and brought salvation to her, then to our family, and then led us all into church and Bible study where now we began a church. And this church has been going for 23 years now. Because a one woman sat down and we saw what she did. You know, we used to come home, we'd see them talking. We didn't know what they were doing per se. I knew they were talking about the Bible and John and all that. We didn't know the extent of what it would mean, nor the impact. We were all kids. But you could witness that and then emulate that and then go with that and be that expert witness. And you never know. Again, one woman with one woman. And we have this church. And the hundreds of people that have gone through this church over the 20 years that we've been here. So, again, as such, always tailor your words in evangelism and witnessing to the person at hand. You've got to have all this different uh, information, knowledge, expertise, but you always bring it down to that individual. Okay? And you don't want to be talking from 20,000 feet in evangelism. Okay? You want to be talking from about uh, a foot above sea level. Okay? <laughs> That's where you want to be talking. A foot above sea level. And give them the information. And then recognize where they're coming from. If they're a business person, speak to them like a business person. If they're in the medical field, speak to them like they're in the medical field and give them some technical jargon. Okay? If they're a homeless person on the street with no education, talk to them like you would with a child that has no education. Whatever the case may be. And then we also recognize that we don't give them some canned speech and use technical jargon when it's not appropriate, when they don't understand it. And again, you know, I grew up under Colonel Abbey Theme Jr. Loved his technical jargon, learned from his technical jargon. And, you know, he passed away back in the early 2000s, okay? But people still stick to the mantra that he used to put out there and the technical jargon. And they put it on Facebook and they think they're witnessing to the world with all this technical jargon. And I'm like, you're only talking to the people that know Colonel Theme. You're only talking to the people that understand Colonel Theme. You're not talking to the rest of the world that needs to know what you know. And so stop throwing all these highfalutin words around. Just get down to the brass tacks of it. What does it mean? And let's get down to that level. And unfortunately, I think because of technical jargon, it turns people off. And because we're not talking from a place of uneducation, people have no idea what we're talking about. And they're like, you're crazy. You're crazy. Or whatever. Okay? They don't understand. And they don't have the capability to understand. So again, we've got to get to that point so they have understanding, because that's what it's about. It's not about throwing the technical jargon around. It's about getting them to understand. Now, in a church with serious students of the Word of God, we can throw technical jargon around because we understand it, and it can help us to get through things a little quicker, except for in this church. We go through things so slow. Just kidding. <laughs> okay. But it would help when you're out there witnessing to the uneducated from a biblical perspective. And the believer must be qualified to be a witness for Jesus Christ by having their specialized knowledge of the Word of God resident within your soul. And again, how would Colonel Theme say this? Perception, metabolization, and application of Bible doctrine. Huh? 
P- oh, oh, no, he wouldn't even say that. He'd say PMA it, folks. How's it unbelievable? Oh, PMA? What's PMA? I can make a couple of jokes right now, but I'm not going to. Okay. What's a PMA? I don't know. What's an ECS? I don't know. I mean, I know. <laughs> you know. Because we taught those things. Edification complex of the soul. Okay. You know these things. But when we're out there, don't throw around edification complex of the soul. Okay. Because it's not going to get anywhere. And so the qualifications come through a consistent, persistent intake and application of Bible doctrine. Okay. Again, I, I, I even hesitate the word Bible doctrine these days. Do you know that? I am starting to cringe at the words Bible doctrine. Because the uneducated person, the unbeliever, Bible doctrine? They hear the word doctrine and they think, you know, Monroe doctrine. No, they probably don't even think that because they don't know history anymore, <laughs> right? Okay. What is a doctrine? People don't know doctrine. But Bible doctrine is what? The Word of God. It's the Word of God. It's the Bible. Fortunately, the word Bible hopefully gets them there, okay? But it's the principles found in the Word of God. And we have to take it in and we have to apply it. Plain and simple. And when we do that through our right past the teacher, not every Tom, Dick, and Harry that's out there on the Internet and just surf the Internet for our teaching, okay? Again, you can supplement, but make sure you're always with your right past the teacher, first and foremost, because otherwise you're not getting the message that you should be getting. You're getting messages for other people in other geographic locations and other walks of life that God has for them. So again, that's why God has assigned a pastor to a congregation, and uh, we flip it and say a congregation to a pastor as well. But there's an assignment there. So God can teach his word. And again, part of the, again, throw some technical words, part of the divine establishment principles. Just as much as a family is important to stay intact and stay together for the teaching and a dissemination of the word of God, so too is a local assembly. So training can also include seminary education. You can go get it there. Participating with other mature believers, as we talked about. Maybe there's an evangelist, you know, or you know, plenty on YouTube. You can watch one on YouTube, see what they do. Okay? Again, it's part of the supplement. All right? Understand how they go about it. And then maybe use some of their tactics or some of their knowledge or information that you've gained. And then from there, uh, you know, observe how they go about it. Watch them. Watch. Watch and learn. Watch and learn. And then, as I said earlier, also now let them watch you. You know, go out with somebody sometime and, you know, let them witness and watch. And then go out again and say, hey, can I take a shot at this? And then do it. See what happens. And then at the end say, what would you think? And hopefully they're a good friend and they're honest <laughs> and they don't just shine you on, okay? But let them critique, you know? Maybe you did do a good job. Maybe there's something you should try or work on here or there and that's good to know you know it's good to know these things you know we can't just tell everybody they're winners okay because not everybody's a winner okay a lot of losers out there okay not everybody gets a trophy all right but we can strive to be winners as we know and we can do that only by refining and let god refine us we see that in the word of god let him have you go through the refiner's fire, the potter's clay. Let him do that with you. And then take and learn from that and then go forward. And then we get into the next category, which is specific examples of an expert witness that they had on their website. <coughs> and number one in this category is that the expert witness can also play the role of damage r- expert, one of the most common roles in litigation. We did talk about this on Sunday. I won't spend a lot of time, but you know what the damage is if somebody doesn't believe. What is that? The eternal lake of fire. Plus living a life of unfulfillment and a life that is not happy and a life that will be under a constant, frantic search for happiness because there's a void in their soul that they're trying to fill. So you know the damage if someone doesn't come to believe in Jesus Christ. 
help them understand those things. And you can come from your own experiences too or other people's experience that you've witnessed. Help them with damage control. Help them with that. And again, this is, as I said on Sunday, where I think we've fallen down in evangelizing in our country over the last few. Nobody wants to talk about hell. No one wants to talk about hell. Why? Because everybody's a winner. Everybody gets a trophy. Nobody goes to hell anymore, apparently. Okay? No, a lot of people are going to go to hell. I'm sorry. Unfortunately. But they choose to go there. Okay? But we need to make that known. And that's a tough one. Because it's the negative. Nobody wants to hear the negative anymore. We just want positive, positive, positive. And I think because of the positive, 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 people, what do I get to lose? (laughs) If there's no hell, what do I get to lose? I'll just live for this life. If there's no life after this, that Satan and his cosmic system tell you, there's no eternal life, or there's just some reincarnation, I get to come back and do it all over again, try to do it better, there's no consequences. There's no consequences to not believing in Jesus Christ. So again, we have to tell people there are consequences to not believing in Jesus Christ, and they are dramatic and devastating. We do not want to spend eternity in the lake of fire. It's not a good place. (laughs) It's not a good place. And Satan doesn't rule there. It's not a kingdom. Okay? Hell is not a kingdom. Okay? It's a place of torment that he is trying to escape too. He wants nothing to do with the lake of fire. Unlike Dante's Inferno. Makes it seem like it's a kingdom. With seven levels of, you know, candy stripes or whatever they call it, you know? It's not that. It's a place of darkness, absence of God, which is tormenting to the soul for all of eternity because God is cut off from them. And by not having God are in and around them, it is the most agonizing thing. It feels and looks like complete darkness, and it feels and looks like f- complete fire and burning. It's kind of interesting. When God is not in their presence, that's what it's like. So again, you got to know what hell is. And you got to know who goes and who doesn't go. So you give right information. And you don't give misinformation. And you let them know what Satan even thinks about hell. He wants nothing to do with it. And then part of this too, as we're going to see this coming up as well, you got to let them know there's a Satan out there too. (laughs) Because Satan has done a great job of hiding himself. So the expert witness continues on. It says, presents the financial information in the cru- and is crucial in helping to determine the appropriate level and amount of damages. Okay? <coughs> now, when we get to this point, for the unbeliever, there's one mode of damage for everyone. Okay? They're all going to the lake of fire. Okay? They're all going there. But for a reversionistic believer, and that's too part of our witnessing, for a reversionistic believer, 1 Corinthians 15, some are sick, some are weak, and a number have fallen asleep. There are levels of damages for the reversionistic or apostate believer. Levels of damages that are possible because they're a child of God. You can let them know that and help to bring them back and say, all right, you might be in the weak, uh, weak stage. Don't go to the sixth stage. Come on back. You know, rebound. Get back in fellowship. You may be sick. Come on back. Don't go to the next stage. Sit unto death. And maybe they're on their deathbed. It's not too late. You're still alive. Come on back. Come back to Christ. And they might recover completely. So again, you never know. But you know what God says. And you can help people understand that as a witness. And then it also says the extent of harm that can be linked to an alleged wrongful act is almost always debatable in the world. So experts can be crucial in assessing these situations. You know, in the world, everything is debatable. Does Satan exist? Does Jesus exist? 
Does heaven exist? Does hell exist? It's debatable. Are there levels in each? It's debatable. Will I go there or not? It's debatable. But you know the information. You know the answers. So communicate that. Give them that. And speak from a position of authority, too. You know dogmatically. This, and, and, and it's not a debate, people. <laughs> I'm not debating you. I'm giving you the facts. These are the facts. You may not like them. You may want to debate them. I'm not debating you. And again, don't get in debates either, okay? In, the, in that you have to justify everything that you're saying, okay? State the facts. Support your facts with the Word of God, okay? Or examples in your life or someone else's life. But you don't have to defend and debate and counter their argument. You don't have to do that. You just state the facts. And the facts say this about salvation. The facts say this about the spiritual life. The facts say this about Jesus Christ. State the facts. The facts state that salvation is found only in Jesus Christ. No other way. And give the information. And as I said, and I don't, that's not a principle for tonight, but as we said on... Uh, a Sunday as well that came up in those principles, okay? Well, even this, you know, helped to reach a conclusion, all right? So again, we do all of this to bring people to the understanding of what's at stake, the understanding of the knowledge of Christ, and we leave it at that. And a principle of an expert witness, it's not your job to win the case, okay? It's your job to present facts, and the case will be decided based on the individual's free will volition. And it's not for up to us to make them believe. It's up to us to give them the information. So again, when you get into debates, it's usually a waste of time. And especially, I can tell, hopefully you can tell, after about two or three questions, this person doesn't want to hear what I have to say. They just want to debate me. And that's when I cut it off. I'm not going to waste my time. Or I'm just going to say, here's the facts, and that's it. And I'll leave it at that. Because I'm not going to get into that debating back and forth, waste of time. About and, and usually it's minutia, things that don't really matter. But they just want to argue because they want to be right. Okay, fine. You're right. But here's the facts. <laughs> just give them the facts so they can understand that and at least let that cycle through their brain because now it's the Holy Spirit responsibility to take that information and if they have positive volition make it effective for their salvation and so likewise again we must not forget the damage or consequences to the unbeliever if they reject the Lord again their salvation the eternal lake of fire we have to make that just as real and understandable to them as we do regarding heaven everybody wants to think about heaven right you, you, you hear that? You know that phrase, all dogs go to heaven? You ever hear a phrase, that dogs go to hell? No, nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody wants to talk about hell, okay? Just all dogs go to heaven. And when they say that, that's the same with people too, isn't it? Isn't the same with us? Everybody goes to heaven? No, it's not. Okay, I'm out of time. I'm going to say this, okay? You know the virgins that have the ten lamps and they're waiting for the second coming of the Lord. Five of them don't have enough oil. They've got to go find oil. Five do. Guess what? The five that have the oil, they're there. They're ready. They're prepared when the Lord returns. They get to go in. The other five, they don't get to go. Who are those other fives? Those are people that believe Jesus Christ but not for salvation. It's not unbelievers as we would say, an unbeliever. Those five virgins, they had oil. They had lamps. In other words, they were in church. They hung around. They knew to be waiting for Jesus, but they didn't believe in him for salvation because they either believed in works or some other system of salvation that depended on them or something else. So again, not everybody goes to heaven. 
And many Christians, I don't even want to use that word, many people that believe Jesus, a lot of people believe in Jesus, but not for salvation. They're going to go to him and say, when did I not praise you? When did I not heal in your name? When did I not do this? And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. I never knew you. That's the five virgins that didn't have the oil in their lamp. And the oil representing the Holy Spirit. So put all that together. So again, make it understandable. And make it as plain to them, and I put in the notes, I'll say this phrase, make it as plain to them as the nose on their face. Okay? Okay? Make the gospel as plain and understandable and recognizable as the nose on their face. That's how we evangelize. That's how we witness. And we don't get involved in all the other garbage. You may want to start with the end times and rapture, but don't spend a lot of time there because they don't know it. Get right back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You may want to spend time on the hardships of the world or the apostasy of the world or the evil of a government. Don't spend a lot of time there. Just use it as an avenue to come to Jesus Christ because they can't understand anything else. But they can understand Jesus, and you can make it as plain as the nose on their face. And that's what we need to do. And as I was alluded to before, Satan's done a wonderful job of deceiving the world and deceiving people that he does not exist and that they don't need salvation and that there's not a heaven and there's not a hell. There just is. He's done a wonderful job. I remember seeing a report, you know, uh, one of these Christian reports, and they talked about, you know, the second coming of Jesus. And, you know, the United States is pretty versed in that in our Christianity. And we're looking forward to it, okay? But they go over to Europe and they ask somebody about the rapture or the second coming of Jesus Christ. They have no idea what you're talking about. They have no idea. What are they, predominantly Catholic? They have no idea what you're talking about because they don't teach it. They don't know it. They don't understand it. Satan's done a great job. Now you don't need to know this stuff. You know, that too is another important aspect. Jesus is coming back. That's part of your evangelist, too. He's coming back. And you can either receive him in the clouds in the air in glory, or you can receive the judgment seat when he does come back. But he's coming back. Again, you know these details. And I say that because I've taught these details over and over and over again. And you should know these. And you do. Use it. Use it. Use it. This is the technical, specialized knowledge that the world doesn't have that we need to give and be equipped to communicate the reality of these things. It's real. This is real, people. <laughs> this is not some fantasy, you know, uh, uh, you know, fantasy Harry Potter movie, okay? This isn't Star Wars or Star Trek or any of these other things, okay? This is real. It's real stuff. And it's going to happen. Jesus came. He's coming back. He's coming back. And are you going to have Lamp in the, uh, excuse me, oil in the lamp, or are you going to have no oil in the lamp? What are you going to have? So, conclusion. And again, conclusion from their standpoint. Again, secular, and then we take it back to Christianity. So they, in their conclusion, says it can be risky not to use an expert in these cases, particularly if the other side has one. Isn't that interesting? Really? Trial lawyers would tell you that when the other side has presented expert testimony, you run the risk, even the likelihood, that the trier of fact will accept the expert's findings purely because you have not presented an alternative. Are you kidding me, people? I, I found this on a website, okay? I found this on a website. This is unbelievable. Can't even take credit for it. Holy Spirit did it. So it says, when faced with a situation that requires an expert, it is best to consult those with years of experience and the reputation to help achieve the best outcome. Do I have to explain this one? <laughs> Satan's got his experts. We have an adversary called the devil. He disguises himself as an angel of light. Also, he leads his minions, which are the fallen angels, plus 
those corrupt pastor teachers and missionaries and evangelists that don't know the truth of God's word and falsify it. And that's what 2 Corinthians is all about. Let me have you go to 2 Corinthians. I had you go to Acts. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. I, I do want to get this one in. Second Corinthians chapter 11. I can't get out of 1 Corinthians. There we go. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 and 15. All right, so you go back to uh, verse 12. It says, but what I am doing, Paul speaking, I will continue to do that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the matter about which they are boasting. They want to be apostles like them. But they're not. They're false teachers. It says, For such men are false apostles, or false messengers, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds. We're not talking about fallen angels here. We're talking about people. People disguising themselves as, you know, prophets and evangelists and, you know, apostles and all this other thing. Because they want the glory. They want the reputation. They want whatever. Okay, maybe the money sometimes. And we see that a lot in the churches in our uh, country today. It's all about money, 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 money. But when we know the truth of the Word of God, it's easy to detect and refute the lies that are out there in the world. You know, again, you can just, when you know the Bible, you can watch things on TV, and you know what the truth is, and you know what the lie is. Very easy to discern. Very easy to discern. And when you are around other Christians or other, uh, you know, uh, church people, you can discern between the truth and the lie very easily. But again, if you don't know the Bible, you can't discern. That's why the Catholic Church does not teach the Bible in most of their congregations. They leave it up to the people. Many times the people do it on their own. I get that. And there are a few that do a great job of teaching the Bible here and there, but they're few and far between. Most of it's a cookie cutter. Most of your denominations do not teach the Bible. They may have a message in the sermon on Sunday, and that's it. See you next week. Okay? Everything else is about ritual or program or process or relationship with each other. Okay? It's not about the relationship with Christ by having the Word of God, the mind of Christ, resident within their soul so they can communicate that to other people. But when you know the truth, when you know God's word, you can see the lie coming from far away. And you can see the false teacher coming from far away. And you ultimately can refute, reprove and rebuke as we should. But if we do not prepare ourselves and do not and or do not go out and witness or evangelize, okay? We are leaving the unbeliever in the world with only one side of the argument. And what side is that? The false one. You see, if the Christians aren't doing this, the world is. The world's already evangelizing. You know, your news programs are evangelizing, okay? It's funny, just bear with me another second. We're almost done here. A NBC, and I saw you know, some uh, uh, Christian group put this out, and it was kind of interesting. You know, Lester Holtz from NBC, okay? The anchor for us all. And the way they say it, the anchor for us all, he's the one we should be listening to. He's the one we should be following. But isn't there an anchor that we all really should have called Jesus Christ? Isn't he the anchor according to the Bible? Yes, he is. But no, Lester Holtz, he's the anchor. Listen to your newsman. And if we do that, we are, and without knowing our Bible, we are going to be influenced. We are going to be deceived. And we are going to be falsified and live in the false viewpoint. 
rather than the divine viewpoint that God gives to each of us. Therefore, if we do not do our jobs as expert witnesses as, you know, for Christ, the unbeliever will have nothing in their soul to be thinking about. And again, you don't have to win the battle of the soul. Not your job to win the battle of the soul. Okay? And again, Satan's world has, you know, a, a, a thousand to one benefit over you. They've got all the airways, all the news programs, all the you know, radio programs, all the magazines and newspapers. He's got them all. God has you. <laughs> you have you. And he's got all the other Christians too. But think of the lopsided game that we're playing or the lopsided trial or courtroom that we're in. But you know what? The lopsidedness is in our favor. Why? Because we have Christ and we have the truth. And that's all that matters. And that cuts through all the falsehoods and all the darkness of this world. We don't need that. And we can win souls with that unbalanced message. So again, only when we have the word of God in our soul and only when we can take that message so they can understand, at least let rattle in their brain once in a while. There's something more out there. There's something better out there. There's something different out there. There's a Jesus out there and I need salvation. At least get them thinking about it and then let the Holy Spirit take it from there. As Ephesians 6.12 also says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual focus of wickedness in the heavenly places. But notice, against the world forces of this darkness. Yes, we talk about Satan's legions of fallen angels that are there, but they're all supporting and backing up all the information that's going on the airwaves and through the governments throughout the, con throughout the world. That's the struggle, the message that they're putting out there. And so again, following up, we've got to pick up and put on the full armor of God so our soul is protected, but even more importantly, recognize that's our fight. And that's what we're up against. And that's what everybody else is up against. Think about the person that doesn't have the armor of God. So now you need to go and help Try to build that armor on them by giving them the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, so let's uh, close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the blessings of this message and uh, being a witness and the honor and grace and glory. And Father, we just ask that you lead us to be better witnesses each and every day. To give the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, to those who direly need it within our own periphery. So, Father, we thank you for this time and give us travel blessings on our way home. In Christ's name, amen.